Okay. Let me know if that's better. It looks like it's going to be better. Thank you for that. And so anytime you guys do attend online, um, please feel free to chat with me. I will do my best to watch and make sure I do have the audio on, but no guarantees that I remember, especially when I'm scrambling because I was late from uh, um, the traffic and stuff. So as I was saying, today I want to go back through the um, kind of finish up this mass balance, talk about non-steady state solutions. Um, what we'll do today is look at the kind of the calculus. Remember, I had to remind myself, okay, what what's going on here? And then, as I mentioned, during the class for homeworks, maybe on an exam, I'll give you something simple that, yeah, you need to be able to derive from, from the mass balance principle, but it's not going to be a complicated integral or anything like that, okay? So we'll take a look at that today and then get on to kind of an introduction to drinking water treatment, um, kind of the basic premises for uh, drinking water side of things. Okay, so last time we were, we were looking at this example 1.5, the question really was, okay, how much, how much stuff is in the outgoing um, stream if we had this word problem where we had some pollutant um, the incoming stream, and I think this is probably talking about bio, uh, BOD, so biodegradable um, oxygen demand or biochemical oxygen demand. So it's probably just pollution generically that's added to this pond, and then this pond is treated like a well-mixed reactor. You've got wind mixing it, you've got some volume, you've got this input from wastewater discharge and a stream and the wastewater discharge and the stream both have some uh, junk in them and so we wrote out the mass balance said we were at steady state and so we said okay zero the accumulation rate is zero for steady state is equal to what's coming in the stream what's coming in plus what's coming in this uh, wastewater discharge minus what's leaving at the end there which is where our question marks are um, and minus what's being removed from bioreaction. So in the volume of the reactor, the rate constant times the concentration. And we knew we had to have the concentration here to the first power because we could tell it was a first order rate because the units here um, were for, were a, for the uh, rate constant was would match a first order rate constant. Okay. And you could look at the units here, right? Volume times some units for K times the mass per volume here would give you just mass. So volume times mass per volume gives you mass. Then you need per time in order to satisfy the, the overall units for this system. Okay, so with that, we can solve um, pretty much by looking for, you know, putting all the pieces in except we're solving for CM. The other thing here is we don't know QM, but the problem we remember said that there was no other sources or sinks of water. So we can just get that QM very easily by saying QM is gonna be equal to the Q coming in from the stream plus the Q coming in from the wastewater. And if we look, that's 0.5 plus five. So that should be 5.5 .5 cubic meters per second. Okay, so uh, from here, we'll essentially solve for CM. I'll simplify a little bit as we, as we do so, and it's really putting in the numbers at that point. Okay, so one thing that's often convenient for a CSDR is to divide everything by Q. So I'll go ahead and do that. So zero equals CS plus CW. Actually, that's not going to be so convenient, right? I'm going to, I'm not going to do that. that. That's convenient if there's only one input and one output, right? We have two inputs here, each different. So instead of that, I'm going to go ahead and get the CMs on the same side and combine them that way. So QM, CM plus VK, CM.
I'm going to write this a little lower. Sorry. Just realized I can't erase what I wrote last time. It doesn't work. <clears throat> so I'm just putting the, the two CM terms on the left. So QCM plus VKCM equals QSCS plus QWCW. Okay, then I can factor out the CMs over here. So this should be QM here. So QM plus VK equals QS, CS plus QW, CW. So then CM will equal QS, CS plus QW, CW all that divided by this QM plus VK. Okay, so then we just need to put in the numbers. We should have all of the pieces at that point. Essentially, it's a more complicated version of doing, you know, getting a governing equation, y equals mx plus b type of thing, and then solving from there. What I'm going to do is put this in Excel. So we're going to say this is equal to the QS was 5 times the CS was 10 plus the QW. 0.5 times the CW is 100. All that divided by this QM, 5.5, plus the volume, which was 10 times 10 to the 6. Which we could do 1 e to the 7th is going to be the same. Um, Take that, multiply it by the k, which was 0.2. Okay, I think I did that wrong. Yes. So, well, let's see. Um, so here we have concentration in milligrams per liter, and the question is, should do we need to put those in meters cubed? I said yes probably too quickly because this number, I was thinking like something here is wrong. What, what's going to happen with the concentrations? Let's take a look because you, you may well be right. Um, if we take a look at our units, concentration over here, it doesn't matter too much what we have here. We'll probably want it eventually to be in milligrams per liter because that's sort of what we started with. That's what things are using. If we take a look over on the right side, and I actually, I did have a units problem in that quick calculation I was doing on Excel. I, and I see it now. Let's take a look at the concentration first. So if we have milligrams per liter, we could do grams, kilograms per cubic meter, whatever, right? But let's see if we can leave it as milligrams per liter because sometimes we can. So over here, we'll have this flow rate, which is cubic meters per second times milligrams per liter. So it looks like, so those volumes don't really work at the moment. Um, but over here, if we keep it, again, cubic meters per second times milligrams per liter and divide all of that over here, cubic meters per second um, plus this uh, cubic meters per day. So if we, if we take a look at all this and how the units are going to cancel, we have cubic meters per second on the bottom. And here's my mistake. We needed per second here and I left it as per day. But if you did have cubic meters per second here, then all of the cubic meters per seconds will cancel and you're left with just milligrams per liter. So in this case, it's fine to, to, not, um, to not track them. Now my mistake in, like I, I took it just as the variables here and then went straight to Excel. Doing it on paper, I think I would make that mistake less often if I were to actually have written out the values here saying CM, 
equals this uh, 5.0 cubic meters per second. Even though it's very cumbersome to do that, it saves me issues like just now. Because if we take a look back at the Excel, what I have right now, I immediately felt to myself, oh shoot, I did something wrong. Because uh, that's essentially five times 10 to the minus fifth, right? 0.00000499. That just doesn't seem right. I've worked this problem before. Um, and what you'll notice is if we did it properly in um, and converted down here, then we would take that volume and instead of multiply it by 0.2, we're going to multiply it by um, a much different number that's going to be, you know, in per seconds, right? So if we take this K and say, well, we really needed that in per seconds, if we're going to keep cubic meters per second here, we'll need to take that and say, this will be, um, we need one day per, times one day per, and it, it turns out that if you do it, it's, I think 86,400 seconds in one day. And so then your, your days will cancel and you'll have just per seconds on the bottom and you'll be left with a much smaller K. Um, so with that in mind, we take this and revise. So instead of 0.2, we're going to take 0.2 and divide that by 86,400 seconds. And then we get 3.5 milligrams per liter, which to me is sounds much more likely to be correct. And we could double check in our book and um, pretty sure that would be the, the answer. So good question there. And there certainly was a units problem. But in this case, fortunately, we could just leave the concentration as it was. Oftentimes, if you have flow rates and concentrations, and it's in a case, a case like this where you're tracking the concentration in the same term on all sides of it, a lot of times it works out so that you don't have to manipulate it, but keep an eye out. Certainly there are times where you would have to uh, adjust things. Okay, any, any questions or issues on this? Does that make sense that kind of the, the structure we followed in terms of writing out that mass balance? Yeah, this one had two inputs, but it wasn't really a big deal. You just track it differently algebraically set it up the same, and it's kind of okay. okay. Great. Okay, so <clears throat> I wanted to talk for a couple minutes about deriving rate constants themselves. And I think I have some data I can pull into Excel and we can um, play with it. But essentially, if we do an experiment or kind of watch what happens in nature, a lot of times we can derive some rate constant for um, for a given problem or phenomenon in um, that that occurs in nature. So that last problem we were just given the k, 0.2 per day. Well, how would you come about that number if you had no information about the system? If you didn't have a word problem telling you. So that's what I'm talking about when I say let's find or derive a K from empirical data. So let's say we have, you know, some data points like this. You could pretty easily see if this is concentration on the Y axis and time on the X axis, you know, you could say to yourself, oh, well, I, you know, if I had those data points, I could put that in my graphing calculator. I could put that in Excel and tell it to give me a line of best fit, right? It would just be you know, look a little better than that, but something like that, right? And you would say, okay, well, I can get the slope of that line and that should give me, let's pretend that's straight. We can get that slope, which would be the M for Y equals MX plus B, right? So that's, that's 
one way to get a rate constant if your system is, let's say in this case, a zero order system. Um, because a zero order system, it doesn't depend on how much concentration is there, the rate stays the same the whole time. The amount that changes, right? The, you know, if it's zero order, that means um, dc dt equals essentially minus k times c to the zero power, right? So no matter what time it is, your change, your change in uh, concentration for that given amount of time is the same amount. You drop two for every one second that goes by or whatever. You know, that's constant. So this is what it looks like for a zero order. So that's easy. You've done that quite a few times in the past, I'm sure. Now, if we were to take a, an exponential decay, so something that's um, first order in nature, question becomes, well, how do, you, how do you find the kinetics for that one? And this, of course, is going to be um, the case where dc dt equals negative kc. So um, that question is, um, is a case where we need to linearize the data so that we can use a simple y equals mx plus b. Or that's, that's kind of the, the easiest way to do it. Excel might be able to do that for you, find a first order or an um, exponential fit, and maybe that works. But on a plot that has concentration here on the y-axis and then time on the x, you're going to have that nonlinear issue. So that's where um, if we can transform that data, it can actually be quite handy and we can linearize it um, just with a little bit of math and then find the k quite easily. So the way to do that would be to take the natural log. So if we take the natural log specifically of the c over c naught. So let's remember for a moment and this is really the, the easiest way to derive a rate constant for any system is just to use a batch case. That's because the batch case, the volume doesn't even matter, right? You've got the volume and the volume. Only thing that you're looking at really is the rate of change, whatever reaction is occurring. You can potentially figure out K from a system that's like a, a CSTR. You could do that if you know all the other stuff about it and you're observing what's happening. It's just a lot more convoluted, a lot more math involved, why do that when you could just do it in a batch reactor where literally the only thing happening is that is that reaction and of course you could do the same up here right you could do the volumes just cancel so in order to understand what's going on why we use that natural log remember that our derivation here for the dc dt for negative k c to the one power this turned out to be that integral of 1 over x dx is natural log of x. So when we integrated this, we ended up with c equals c naught times e to the minus kt for the batch system. So with that in mind, if we wanted this in a linear form, we said we could take the natural log and actually, I guess you, this one we took e to the power of both sides to even remove the natural log in the first place. So if you maybe even didn't go that far and just started with that natural log um, spot, you'll remember we started with natural log of c minus natural log of c naught. You could write that as natural log of c over c naught equals um, minus kt. So if we just left it in that form to begin with and graphed it, well, look, we have pretty much the same thing as the y equals mx plus b, not even a b here. So it would be, we'd start at zero if we're to decay. Um, and this would be, you know, negative one, negative two, and so on. So without any starting point here, a decay reaction would simply start at zero and have a nice linear line. And that slope here would be K for the natural log of 
C over C naught equals minus KT. So that's for the first order case. Does that make sense? So it's it's conceptually it's pretty simple once you once you see it all written out in that way. Um, so maybe we can do a quick demonstration with some actual numbers. I think put some together at some point. Okay, so we can something we can do here. As I've got a couple of examples that we can uh, simply look through and graph and see if we need to linearize them and how that how we might do that in an Excel sheet. And I'll I'll uh, post this with today's notes as well. Okay, so just taking a quick look here, we have time zero to sixty minutes, some concentration that's decreasing, and if you look at it. You know, the first time point, it changes from 28 to 13, that's pretty much half. From 13 to 5, that's a little more than half, you know, or that's, you know, a little more than half. The point being that's, okay, a change of like 1,500 units, and then a change of uh, 900 units, and then a change of 200 units. That does not look linear. So just looking at the data, we'll see this come out when we graph it. That doesn't look particularly linear. The second example, we have a few hours. This one's changing, and it looks kind of like it's changing between three and four units each time, so that one does look more linear. So just as a, you know, a kind of a preconceived notion here, it looks like maybe, maybe a linear situation. Okay, so just taking this data, if we are to insert a graph, We see, yeah, that looks exponential in nature. So we think to ourselves, well, if we're lucky, this is exactly first order and nothing weird or different. Otherwise, you know, not second order, not not 1.5 order, which can sort of be a thing sometimes. We're not going to worry about that. Um, so assuming this is first order, what we can do then, set this aside, is we can say, well, let's linearize it, and so let's change this into ln of the c over c naught. So we'll make a column so that we can plot that versus the, the time instead of this concentration. So what that's going to look like is literally take the that initial time point divided by itself, um, and there's a cool Excel trick that I've learned not too long ago, is if you're in the little equation editor and you want to add like the dollar signs to freeze the freeze the numbers or freeze the letters um, first of all that that's something kind of cool that you can do in case you didn't know if you add a dollar sign before the number that freezes the number so even if you fill it downwards it keeps that as number three well another thing you can do is actually hit f4 and it just cycles through the dollar signs it can, pressing f4 goes from just the number to just the letter to both or none. So that's kind of cool in case you like Excel stuff. Okay, um, and I didn't add the natural log and I really should. So let's add the natural log there. What's that? I struggle with Excel. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, good. So I'll, I'll try to give plenty of, plenty of Excel. Uh, demos for you guys. Excel is is amazing. I don't know. I, I always like it. So what I just did there was I pressed control D after I selected the, what I wanted. So you, you can kind of hold well, on a PC, hold shift and then down, left, right, whatever. And then control D for filling down 
There's other ways you can do that. You can click and drag the thingy. But So what I did was I basically took that same equation, filled it downward so that here, when we take a look, it's taking the C, which is 30 minutes for that time point, divided by the C naught, which is that initial one. So that's, that's what I did there to create essentially these five different points, all representing the natural log of C of the current C that you have at that moment divided by the initial C that we had in that, in that system. So then if we take um, another graph, it's not really what I wanted, but we'll go with it. Then we take a look and plot it this way. So we have that, that system linearized. Now we have a line that looks pretty reasonable. And we can, of course, add a trend line and tell it to give um, probably set y-intercept to 0. We can display the r. We can display the equation itself. And then we will have a way where now just with couple moments on Excel we have that data and we've taken it and we have a equation and we found K for whatever arbitrary data that I made up the other day so isn't that exciting so now we can say oh, okay our K is 0 0.0643 and that's a decay reaction so we could do the same thing for this other data here See if it just gives us the graph nice and simple. And from this other graph, you can see without any transformations, it already does look pretty much first order. So it would not make, or zero order, uh, pretty linear as it is. So it would not really make sense to transform that in any way. We just use it as it is. Okay. So we'll save that. that don't need it okay so that's that's something I wanted to show of course the same process will work for a growth equation uh, to find find growth um, a growth rate it's just going to be the same exact process okay so for non-steady state systems there's a couple things we might be interested in in a non-steady state system what you can imagine is happening is something called a step function response. So if you have a wastewater treatment reactor or drinking water treatment reactor, you have a set amount of contaminants coming in and maybe they are being treated. So you've got some removal, but your system reaches steady state. So inside your reactor, you have a set a concentration that it persists, right? Even though you have a reaction removing it, it's completely mixed, let's say for a CSDR, and you're essentially at steady state. What that looks like in the reactor then is the concentration is flat. Okay, while you're at steady state, inside that system, concentration's flat, even though your input concentration might be up here, um, and you've got some reduction because of the reactions that are going on. So with that in mind, what happens if you suddenly get a big spike in your influent? You know, something changes, you have a step function, maybe you stop putting anything in, you start putting just clean water and you have a big drop all of a sudden. So that you could have a sudden drop. Um, then what happens? Well, you probably, like if you have a sudden drop to zero, then your concentration will quickly start decreasing. Um, drop to zero in your input. If you have a sudden increase in your input, then you might have a sudden increase like that. If you have, um, if you were to just instantaneously add a whole bunch and mix it all of a sudden, maybe this jumps up and then you're, but your uh, the amount you're putting in normally just is stays the same the whole time. Then after that jump up, it would be gradually coming back to your steady state. So there's all sorts of things you can imagine what happens with a step change, a step input. 
Um, and so that's kind of what I'm t talking about here. Here is some sort of instantaneous change that's going to affect the system, knock it out of balance in terms of away from steady state, and then ability able to re-equilibrate -equil later. Now it is it could be that you just change your influent concentration and it stays that way, and then instead of like this jump, you could just imagine it's going to gradually reach a new steady state. So all sorts of things that could happen um, to knock your system out of steady state. The, and there's a couple things that you could look for. Is one is that new steady state concentration, right? If you, if you do have a new influent concentration or a new exit amount, that, that could change things. And so you might be interested in the concentration at time infinity. So that's essentially guaranteeing you reach steady state again. So with your new conditions. So that's one thing that we could look at. But a lot of times we're going to want the concentration at a given time. Um, so before we, before we get there, we can derive this equation based on our mass balance. So if we take a look and we consider that um, you know, our accumulation rate eventually is going to come back to zero, we can, we can take a look at our system. Just go ahead and write it out. V dc dt. And this would be for, let's say, a CSTR. Equals the Q in CN minus, we'll go ahead and put that. Yeah, that's, in is fine. Actually, I think this is. I think the CI here is the initial C, like here, not the what's coming in. Anyway, so then we have whatever Q is going out, C in the system, plus any growth that's happening, minus any decay that's happening. And we'll just assume it's first order. Then at infinity, what we can do is we can take a look at, we, we can assume that this reaches zero, the accumulation reaches zero at infinity, um, but then we have to um, deal with seeing things a little bit differently. Now, okay, this, this derivation is just algebra from this equation. I don't remember what all assumptions they put in um, and I, I have to admit, I did rush a little bit this morning. So I didn't get that. It's my wife's birthday today. So I, today's a little bit different than normal. Um, this, is, this was a simple process from, um, from this generic equation. Now, I've got what the book does for the rest of it working from here. But I just wanted to note, you could solve for C infinity. Um, and that's essentially looking, looking at the fact that what your, your change is essentially C infinity minus what you started with, CI, the initial, I think is how they did it. So there's some relation like that. Don't worry too much about it. I'm not expecting you to work this part of it. I just wanted to note that you could solve for C infinity, but that's, you know, and that, that might be useful sometimes, but that's not what we're focusing on. I would give you this if you, if you ever need it on an exam. Okay, but starting there um, and then taking a look at solving for C at some given time, which is kind of more what we're interested in, you know, what, what's the concentration five minutes after we make this change um, is it sometimes more interesting or how long until it reaches, you know, this amount of uh, contaminant. So we'll take that DC DT equals, and we had a volume on both sides here, or we had a volume here that we divided both sides by. This is going to look pretty similar to where I was going with it the other day, and I kind of got lost um, with it. So dc dt equals negative q divided by v plus kd, all that times c minus this qc initial plus k, any kv for growth, 
divided by Q plus K decay in that volume for a decay reaction. So we have both reactions occurring. You know, if they're there, we would put them in those terms. So that's the general um, form of it, again, coming from the mass balance. We can transform that and say, because we can derive this C at infinity is the same thing as this guy, we can sub that in. Um, we can just say that C at, that's the concentration at infinity. So in this case, dc dt equals this stuff times C minus C at infinity. From here, the integration can go forward easier if we make a substitution. And this is what I was forgetting. Well, that and the defining this part as C at infinity. So if we say y equals C minus C at infinity, then we can do dy dt a little easier um, and solve, do a, an integration that is simpler. If you remember that, uh, I guess, it, I don't remember the specific term it's called, um, substitution or whatever. So we say dy dt, we'll say that's the same thing as dc dt, because if c at infinity is not changing and you're defining y as c minus c not, uh, c at infinity, then really if c changes, then y changes, right? So the rate at which y changes is the same as the rate at which c changes. So in that sense, c at infinity is constant. This holds up to be true. This dy dt equals dc dt. So then we can say, okay, well, dy dt is easier. We can say that's just minus all these constants times y. And that's something we actually know how to handle, right? So we, we can say dy dt equals minus q over v plus k times y. We can integrate that from y initial to y final. And on the other side, just take the dt and integrate that constants out in front. That'll give us that familiar form y equals y naught times e to the minus kd plus q over v times t, because why not? So just couldn't, couldn't help the problem. Um, okay, so from there, we can substitute back in. We know that y naught should be c naught minus c at infinity. And we can kind of put some things back together and say, okay, well, c minus c at infinity is equal to c naught minus c at infinity times, you know, just basically substituting back in. And then finally we can solve and say c at some time t is going to be equal to c at infinity plus c naught minus c infinity times e to the negative kd plus q over v times t. Okay, so we can get a general expression for a non-steady state system like that. Now that's assuming that you may have growth, you may have decay, all these things. Well, I guess in this case, maybe the, this example might be using no growth equation. Actually, not sure about that. I think I think they dropped the growth and just went with decay. Unless it all is only going in there. Anyway, um, yeah. So there's, I guess, if there is some sort of growth that's captured in C at infinity, and then it's not needed. At any rate, we could do that, um, and I'm not going to expect you to go through all of that on an exam. Like I said, there will be a, a homework problem, but it's going to be simpler. You're not going to need, I don't think you'll even need this Y substitution. Um, and I will probably come back and do a better job deriving that C at infinity um, next time. But it's in the book. It's It wasn't too difficult um, if you wanted to take a look for yourself. So that's, at the end of the day, it's similar to our steady state systems where we start with a 
the overall mass balance principle, matter is not going to be created or destroyed. We set up our system to track the, the matter where it goes, except we just know that there is some accumulation in the system and we solve, right? That solving takes some, a little bit of calculus, but not much. Um, and even in our steady state systems, occasionally we might run into that. Um, we could have a steady state plug flow reactor and still need that calculus to derive it. <clears throat> anyway, um, does that make a little bit of sense? Probably not perfect sense, which is okay. All right, from there, I wanna talk about drinking water. Um, and when we talk about drinking water, uh, really we, we start with kind of the, the fundamentals. And that is that we don't want to drink poop. Just that's <laughs> kind of where you have to start. So it's, of course, awkward to say it that way, but if you think about water treatment in general, and if you think about the pathogens that are food or waterborne, Really, it comes down to fecal-oral route of transmission is the major player. Um, this is true. So let's imagine we have uh, some river, and you're considering taking water from that river, and you want to drink it. You put it in your nice little glass here. Well there's a few things you might want to be concerned about, right? If there's this river is flowing and maybe there's somebody upstream using the water and they have a poorly drawn toilet here and it flushes and goes down, well, then you've got a problem. So let's say your river's flowing this way. You don't want to drink the poop, right? And so, Kind of the first barrier in some sense is wastewater treatment. So if I were to draw this, that we'll say wastewater treatment goes here. As a barrier to that fecal oral route of transmission. Because you could imagine you'd also probably want to protect the river um, from, from any uh, contamination because you might want to swim in the river. You might want to um, go fishing or do whatever, you know, things where you could actually ingest um, someone else's wastewater, which you don't want to be doing. Um, turns out that that's not really sufficient because, you know, of course, there are animals. Let's, let's have a, an amazing animal here. Some sort of antlers or ears or something. Um, and of course, they also have droppings that get into the river or get washed into the river. So now you know I'm an amazing artist and you know why we need drinking water treatment because we definitely need a second barrier here to the fecal oral route of transmission because that could be gross. Of course, if you're taking groundwater, the considerations are a little different. Um, maybe there's more mineral contaminations you will be concerned about. Um, but in essence, in terms of kind of the history of drinking water treatment, surface water is always pretty common, or if you are doing well water, it's in the, in the past, it has typically not been deep enough to really get away from potential fecal contamination. So most of the burden of disease from drinking water related illness comes from this route of transmission, right? So when we take a look at why we care about treating our drinking water, this is the first and most obvious. Polio, for example, the waterborne, food and waterborne disease was the fecal oral route of transmission. It turns out um, COVID is also uh, excreted in human waste. Probably not likely that you're going to get um, infected in that manner, but presumably since you, it is does uh, have a gut infection if it did last long enough and you did ingest um, contaminated water, perhaps you could have a, an intestinal infection with SARS-CoV-2, um, perhaps even without the respiratory or maybe it would develop later, I don't know. But, you know, it, there are quite a few pathogens that 
you will be familiar with that can be prevented with proper uh, water treatment. Okay, so that's sort of the, uh, <laughs> the fundamentals there. Of course, your water supply is gonna dictate a lot of your treatment requirements. A lot of what we'll deal with pertains specifically to either surface water or maybe groundwater, although we will talk about some considerations for, okay, what would it take to desalinate water, some things like that. But, you know, generic picture of the water cycle here, just to kind of think about the different places you could take water from. And, you know, as we consider later in the semester, the wastewater treatment, where are you discharging to and what, what um, concerns might you have for where stuff is going. Okay, so for a typical water treatment system, it's more than just the plant. Again, you have to think about, okay, what, um, what source are you taking from? Do you have a reservoir? Are you getting it from a well? Taking it from some surface water stream, something like that. That's gonna dictate what your treatment plant looks like. So that's kind of the first consideration. Then you design your treatment plant, and then you need a distribution system. And one thing we'll take a look at is really for a water water distribution system does in a sense count as part of your treatment process itself because it is it needs to keep the water clean um, or free of added contaminants on the way. We will talk about the Flint water crisis and how that was a major failure, especially on the side of that distribution system, but really that problem turns out it, it really stemmed from an issue with the water treatment plant itself. Okay, from there, you know, that's gonna feed uh, maybe industry, but also homes for domestic, um, domestic water. From there, that's kind of, that's kind of like the, the major topic area that we're talking about now, that side of stuff, and then after that, you'd get to the wastewater. You know, after you consume it, you have wastewater, maybe some considerations. We'll come back to this little graphic um, in the, in the um, last section of the course. What I will say, though, is in terms of water treatment versus wastewater treatment, a lot of the same concepts, a lot of the same technologies are applied to both. We'll, we're going to dive into sedimentation if, you know, possibly today, probably next time. Um, and sedimentation, you can certainly you certainly do use in both drinking and wastewater treatment, um, just slightly different applications there. And so almost everything that we cover is relevant to both. And I'm just going to start with the ones that are typical of a surface water treatment plant. Okay, so just a quick example of what impact this uh, the treatment of um, treatment of water has had. Typhoid fever, it's another fecal oral route of transmission. Might, I think typhoid, you might also be able to spread um, through uh, aerosols. I'm not quite sure. Um, but anyway, um, early 1900s, before 1910, was really the first ever chlorination that was put in. A little bit of ozonation started even way back then as well, but ozone is always, or, you know, was always a bit more expensive and harder to deal with. So it's mostly chlorination that was used. And you can see, you know, this line here in the US, I'm pretty sure that not, it wasn't like an instant, everybody had chlorination, <laughs> chlorinated water, but it, it began there and you can see a, a significant drop in typhoid fever. And this is a race. So this is per, per population basis. So even though the population was growing, the, this rate was decreasing. And by 1950s, we're pretty much rid of it because in the U.S. we have a pretty significant and robust um, municipal drinking water system by then. So that's that's kind of, you know, there's other factors, I'm sure, uh, but that's really a big one. Um, eradication of poliovirus, of course, was largely due to a, the vaccination, but there's also, you know, it's also chlorination would play a very big role in that. Um, before the vaccine was available. So in 1974, we um, had the Safe Drinking Water Act. This really formalized a lot of things that had already become practice. And 
this really set forth two types of standards. Um, these primary standards and secondary standards. And really what they're aiming to address specifically was toxins and pathogens, right? So if you think about anything that could bother you from the drinking water, obviously the pathogens, that's what I was talking about with the fecal oral, um, but also toxins. Um, so if you have well water and there's something toxic, maybe arsenic, you don't want to be drinking that. So um, well water, uh, surface water, whatever it is, we don't want either of those issues. So the primary standards relate directly to health effects. So whatever's in the primary standards from this Safe Drinking Water Act, these are enforceable by law. So if a municipality is um, selling water, distributing water, then by law they have to meet certain standards, these primary standards, to ensure that um, whether it's chemical, radionuclides, or microbial um, contaminants, that they are uh, below a certain limit or not detectable, depending on what it is. So, uh, in addition to those primary standards, which are pretty obvious, you know, there's if we identify, we know lead is a big problem, we don't want any lead in our water. So, you know, to the best and most reasonable detection standards we can use, it must not be above that amount, uh, for example. For our secondary standards, these ones are actually not enforceable. These ones are just more aesthetic. Uh, this is, um, you know, what color is your water? Well, as long as the primary standards are met, color doesn't really matter. But there are some recommendations. Um, generally, it's recommended that there's not much color, if any, uh, in your water that you're supposed to drink because, you know, consumers are not going to be so happy with colored water. Um, even just that thought probably makes you think of like it gives you probably a little disgust reaction, right? And when I'm talking here about all this uh, very, you know, jargon-esque fecal oral route of transmission, it probably hits you a little different than thinking about if this was kind of tinged with a brown color. That probably causes a much more disgust sort of reaction to you, especially in that context. <laughs> so it, it's clear why we, we would want the taste, the odor, even temperature to be uh, um, pleasant. But it, it is also true that a municipality could be serving water that looks gross or smells gross, but is actually safe and they're legally doing so. Um, in which case, maybe I would recommend like a Brita filter or something like that. Uh, another one would be hardness. We'll get into that. I do plan to add um, add a section on water softening to deal with hardness um, in our next, uh, kind of after the first exam. So essentially there's, there's several things that we might care about. Not all of them are regulated by standard. You know, you could have hard water, it doesn't affect your health, but it might be inconvenient because of all the uh, mineral scum that you end up depositing. Speaking of hardness, it varies depending on where you are, where you're getting your water. So this is sort of a general concentration of hardness as calcium carbonate. Um, and this, I think, is groundwater. Um, and if you take a look, you might find kind of, if you've diff visited different places or lived in different places, it might be kind of interesting to identify um, where, it, where it's, what it's been like where you've lived. So I grew up um, North Georgia, um, spent a couple years in central Michigan, and now we are down here. I think we're probably slightly in that purple area, uh, but certainly I would guess New Orleans would be in that, that white patch. So if you think about it, you may have experienced different hardnesses of water depending on where you lived, and maybe you had well water, or maybe it was well water, but you also had deionization. You know, there's different things you might you might actually be able to identify by thinking about it. Oh, you know, th the water felt different there. It felt different when I soaked, you know, I took a shower and I lathered soap on my arm or whatever. The hardness actually affects that. So hardness, um, the, it will affect soap in that if it's super soft water, it'll feel like you can never get the soap off if it's really soft water because the soap 
um, we'll we'll talk about this in a few lectures, but there's this uh, component of the ions in water help facilitate the contact between some surface and some other surface. So if soap is in there between, there's not very many ions, it's hard to get to the surface um, all the way. And it just ends up giving you a sort of a slippery feel, um, even if the soap is pretty much gone. Very hard water will make it difficult for the soap to actually form bubbles in the first place. It'll, it'll kind of prevent that. So you need more soap with hard water. So then you're adding a whole bunch of soap and then you get more soap scum. It's like you're precipitating out these calcium deposits that are calcium soap stuff. Um, and just the dripping faucet will, will just uh, leave soap, uh, mineral scum around and you'll have to like, scrape it off or use some something some chemicals to dissolve it again and, and all that. So depending on where you've been, you might have experienced some of that. Okay, so for drinking water then, where do we start? This would be a, a common surface water treatment plant schematic where we have some surface source. Um, we would send that first through a screen or bar rack, something to sort out, get all the large chunks of debris out of the water. Say you're taking um, from a local river or something, you, you definitely don't want uh, tree limbs or basketballs or whatever floating through to get into your plumbing that's going to be important. You'd follow that with a grit chamber. So you're going, you're downsizing from the basketball to maybe the golf balls and smaller, right? Small particles, chunks of gravel, whatever that has got kicked up into the influent that you really don't want, again, messing up in your sensitive plumbing, all the, the pumps that are involved and the different things, really just taking the, the first set of stuff that's really easy to separate out. So that doesn't take a whole lot of energy. It's mostly just by the flowing water that's going to be flowing anyway. Um, and usually you'll, you'll have some sort of elaborate mechanism so that you can do that in a way that just sorts everything and um, makes kind of a, a trash pile um, in sort of an automated system. Then we get to sedimentation. And what we would first do is what we would call primary sedimentation. So the first shot of sedimentation, that's essentially, we want to use gravity for as much as we can. So we send it through sedimentation, whatever particles can settle, whatever chunks of stuff, yeah, we'll go ahead and settle it. But realistically, as we'll learn in this coming section, sedimentation can do a lot more if we just add a little bit of um, coagulants to them. So typically what we'll do is sediment whatever we can, send that sludge that's coming out of that sedimentation, kind of collects at the bottom, send that to sludge processing. That usually just means squeezing the water out of it as best we can and sending, sending it to a landfill. We'll, we'll take the water from there, add a coagulant. This destabilizes particles, causes them to stick together, make larger particles, and physics will tell us that those larger particles will settle faster. So then we, we add all that stuff. It's just like a rapid mix thing. Then we send it to a chamber to slowly allow particles to come together, um, meet each other, get together, hang out. And then, so that's gentle mixing. Then we put them back into sedimentation, which is essentially very slow laminar flow. We don't want any mixing in the sedimentation. So the particles will, will have been flocculating or have already done so and then they'll be heavier or larger and we'll settle out. So that, that way we can get rid of a lot of particles. Some systems will skip this secondary sedimentation, uh, potentially even the primary, uh, in place of just direct filtration. And if they do that, that's probably gonna be sand or granular filtration. Regardless, either way, and, and that decision will probably depend on how much particle matter you expect you're getting groundwater and you're doing these operations probably not a whole lot of particles so you might you might rearrange it based on your needs but a lot of times you'll follow that sedimentation with filtration catch some of the finer particles that could be granular or membrane then you'll add a disinfectant and allow that disinfection some contact time one thing you'll notice here 
is whereas they had kind of a square type reactor shapes for the flocculation and the coagulant dosing, here we have the snake-like. So that's going to be almost always our disinfection is going to be a plug flow reactor. And then out um, to distribution. Uh, a lot of times we'll add fluoride uh, just before that. Your water is essentially polished and ready uh, to be sent out. So with all that in mind, that's kind of be going to be the approach we take in the class is to first talk about sedimentation, then about coagulant dosing and flocculation, kind of the same, uh, same sort of thing, deal with filtration, and then go on to disinfection, um, other advanced oxidation processes, and we'll also talk about softening, which would, which would be a step that happens right around the disinfection time. We have to manipulate pH for softening, and we want a controlled pH for our disinfection process, and we want to control and have our pH slightly higher for the distribution, all to take care of the different components. So there's gonna be a lot of pH adjusting and stuff. Usually those, those types of processes are gonna to happen towards the end, when we're just about ready, we're doing that, those polishing steps. So we'll talk about that um, uh, and in a wastewater treatment plant, it's gonna be a little bit similar for the sedimentation part. We usually do have two sedimentations, but in the middle we'll have bioreactors and then we will have a disinfection step at the end typically, um, but we don't necessarily dose for residual disinfectant because we actually don't want chlorine in our wastewater effluent. So rivers and streams don't like chlorine. Okay, so with that, I did want to do a quick attendance um, thing today, and we'll get into sedimentation next time. So let me load up Kahoot. I don't think I have any specific quiz-like thing, but I'm just trying to make, going to try to do this for you. Um, most every day for class, so we have plenty of opportunities here. I do have, um, was wanting to get a little bit of feedback for you. This is an old feedback quiz activity. I'm not sure how relevant the questions are going to be, but regardless, we can, uh, you know, even if it doesn't make too much sense, just fill out whatever and give me your opinions as if they're relevant. So go to kahoot.it put in this game pin, and then put in your 8-9 number as your nickname. All right. So I see three viewers online and eight in class, so that should be everybody here. Okay, so do you like the balance of problems in class? I think this is a, an activity I did sort of at the end of the semester one time. So. Just give me your current current thoughts. It'll look like there's a right answer, but there's not. The right answer is putting your correct uh, eight nine number in. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. What do you think about the presentation style in general? And I realize maybe I should turn off some of the lights for you next time. Don't 
hot dog. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, so thinking about attendance, um, yeah, it's a decent, decent questions here. And still like your opinions. Right now, kind of what I'm doing is sort of the require, require uh, not necessarily in class, but in uh, live attendance. Okay, so, and, and so my, my thinking here is what I'm trying to do is encourage you to be here, or at least online like the three of you are right now, I, I may have to think about it if people are still struggling from Ida and stuff and not able to attend live, but are listening to the lectures on their own time. I don't really want to penalize that approach right now. So definitely, if you listen to this later and that's that's you, um, talk to me and I'll try to sort something out. Um, and you know, I'll think about it as I as I go. Okay, last one. Um, Regarding the recorded lectures, um, is it helpful to have both recorded lectures and the um, and the slides posted? Okay. Okay. And again, in the future, I'm going to try to get the lecture slides posted before class in case anybody wants to go with them. I do apologize for not doing that. Um, this, yeah, I, I should be able to do do a better job at that as I get into my normal routine of the lectures I already have prepared. Right now, I've sort of been adapting everything at least a little bit. Um, I will also post your first homework by Thursday, and I'll send an email reminder out for that. So look for that. Um, thank you for the feedback, and we'll see you guys on Thursday. <laughs>